School of Public Health, the Associate Dean of Diversity. Dr. Rosenthal received her PhD in Health Policy at Harvard University. Her research examines the design and impact of market-oriented health policy mechanisms with a particular focus on the use of financial incentives to alter consumer and provider behavior. Dr. Rosenthal's work has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, Health Affairs, and numerous other peer-reviewed journals. She was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2014. Based on her work, Dr. Rosenthal has been called to testify before the U.S. Congress and other state legislatures. During the 2008 presidential campaign and post-election transition, she provided policy analysis to President Obama's healthcare team regarding opportunities for Medicare payment reform, pay for performance, and cost control. Dr. Rosenthal is a member of the Massachusetts Public Health Council and the board chair of Massachusetts Health Quality Partners, a multi-stakeholder quality improvement organization. I also want to plug in here to my uh, fellow Yale alumni that uh, Meredith is a, a, a rare um, example of a nice Harvard person. <laughs> 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 How's that, that for a backhanded it. compliment? <laughs> In my old age, my circulation's pretty bad, so I might move around a little. <laughs> so maybe it will get warm here, and uh, forgive my chattering teeth. Okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. And it's really wonderful to join you here today. And I, I was particularly struck by Cheyenne's opening remarks. And I, I do want to think about these issues as very personal. Uh, I spend a lot of time standing in front of rooms full of physicians, in particular, talking about payment reform, and people are uncomfortable, uh, both because uh, this is all about the livelihood of physicians, but also, and much more importantly, uh, it, payment reform very frequently feels like a challenge to professional ethics and uh, questioning of why physicians and other clinicians uh, do what they do. And so I, I want to make it really clear that when, uh, when I think about payment and delivery system reform, I don't ever think about this as a need to change the motivation of clinicians and other staff who support patient care. The individual motivations are there. This is really about systems. And, uh, and I think the most appropriate way to think about payment reform, which is not to say that everyone designing these policies thinks this way, is how do we get the payment system out of the way of optimal patient care? Uh, so, uh, and in particular, when, uh, when we talk about fee-for-service and its limitations, uh, it seems to me that uh, this is one of the big challenges when we think about optimal patient care, it very, very rarely uh, involves sort of face-to-face -face interventions with patients on a one-off basis, that optimal patient care is much more holistic, and it doesn't only take place when the patient is in the office. And I think that's the fundamental reason why we wish for payment reform. So I have relatively few slides, and um, I will talk through them, but I hope that, uh, that we'll have a chance to talk. I'm very interested to hear what's going on in the systems here. I know a little bit about Oregon, 
uh, and I know that there's quite a lot of activity, uh, but what it looks like from 30,000 feet from the policymaker perspective or the payer perspective, which is um, much more of what I see, uh, no doubt is extremely different from what it looks like at the front line. So I'm, I'm eager to hear from all of you as, uh, as patients, consumers, uh, people in the system uh, and providers. So, oh, let's see, interesting. My slides look a little funny but they look okay up there. <laughs> so um, so one of the issues that I wanna emphasize today is this idea that we're on a path towards a reformed payment and delivery system. Uh, and one of the big challenges is the sort of the slow transition from the current set of payment systems uh, to some future nirvana payment system. Um, and we can sort of uh, agree, I think, uh, as Paul's been saying, there, you know, reasonable people can agree on a number of some of the sort of underlying issues here uh, that it would be ideal to have a system in which uh, care was centered around patient needs and wants. Uh, and also uh, where care was prospectively thinking about entire populations and not just a single person with an immediate need in front of us now, that sort of notion of population health that is planful and coordinated and, uh, and very holistic around the needs of a population and uh, coordinated and not just focused on um, have we delivered a given service efficiently and effectively, but really uh, looking more broadly at the value of care. And again, to make this personal, you know, the reason that we each care about the cost of care is that we don't wanna spend all of our household budgets on healthcare. And we don't want our state governments to spend all of their budgets on health care. Uh, while health may be one of, if not the most important thing to us as human beings um, and our pursuit of happiness in general, health care is not the same as health. Uh, and as we, as we look at what we can spend our resources on as a society, it may well be that education uh, and uh, transportation and urban development, these things may contribute a lot more to health than individual healthcare services. And so when we're talking about cost control, I would again say that it's very useful to think about this very concretely in terms of uh, what, what are the objectives that we're looking for. Cost control is not good in and of itself. Um, it is a question of are there better uses of our resources uh, to pursue other human objectives? Uh, and um, taking money out of the healthcare budget is only good to the extent uh, that it makes it available for things that are more highly valued. And I would argue, um, as Paul showed a lot of, uh, of um, numbers and charts that demonstrate that we do have very high and growing spending on healthcare in the US, that we are at a point uh, where many pieces of data suggest that some of our healthcare spending is delivering very low value. Uh, and the, the main concern in terms of cost control then is how do we identify that low value spending, not the high value spending, and eliminate that, freeing up resources for other pursuits. Uh, and so, well, it would be hard to argue against uh, the end goal here, uh, how we get there is much more complicated. Uh, and where payment and delivery system reform fits into that is also more complicated. And in that context, I should just uh, note that I had a, a paper come out on a physician, uh, the merit-based in payment incentive payment system that I'll be talking about a little bit later this week. And there was um, a, a Google Hangout. This is my first uh, social media discussion <laughs> through the New England Journal of Medicine this week. And there were a, a bunch of you know, pointy-headed people like myself trying to talk about physician payment reform. And there was a, one physician who had uh, developed a practice that was uh, insurance-free it was, all, um, it was all being delivered direct care, and uh, the conversation didn't get very far because we kept coming back to um, his idea that really uh, payment reform is, the, is wrong, the wrong solution altogether, and I think it'd be interesting to have some of that discussion 
here as well, but that you know, what we really need is some form of consumerism, having consumers take a more active role um, in deciding what care to get and getting insurers out of the picture. I don't personally agree with that, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting discussion and I'm glad we're gonna hear more about uh, the patient voice in all of this from Mark uh, l later on this morning. Uh, so, just as a, as a precursor, I'll be focusing here on the delivery system, on the supply side, but uh, whenever we're thinking about trying to accomplish these same objectives, uh, there is a parallel set of initiatives that one could imagine to influence the way consumers and patients access care, uh, including how much they pay uh, and how much insurers pay, but also um, how they get information about the relative value of a given service or the comparative quality of different healthcare providers for the same service. So um, as we start this journey towards uh, value-based care, that patient-centered, uh, value-oriented care that uh, seems so desirable, uh, there are many questions about exactly how we will get there. And, uh, and one of them, we can think about payment reform and delivery system reform as uh, evolving both vertically and horizontally. So I stole this chart. Uh, from with, with citation, although it doesn't show up uh, very clearly over there, from the advisory board. Um, and uh, I'm gonna talk a bit today about how a number of payment and delivery system reforms are opt-in. That is, they are, uh, they are uh, not mandatory. Uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in particular has a number of alternative payment models that one can uh, choose to participate in. Uh, but then we also, of course, have many different payers. So there's Medicare, Medicaid, um, a whole range of commercial payers. So I, as a hospital or healthcare system, uh, can have different payment models across different, uh, different payers. So I think of that as sort of the vertical diffusion of payment reform, and the horizontal diffusion is across providers. Uh, and this chart is intended to capture that vertical diffusion. I'm a healthcare system, I've decided to join the new Medicare Accountable Care Organization model, um, but still 90% of my patients are being reimbursed under the old system where physician services are uh, reimbursed on a fee-for-service basis and uh, hospital services on a per-discharge basis. And, uh, and that differentiation within a provider makes it very challenging, of course, uh, to figure out where your best investments should be made uh, and how to align the system with those payment, those payment incentives inherently. Because it effectively, um, in the fee-for-service model, which I'm using sort of as shorthand, hospitals don't really get paid fee-for-service, but when I say fee-for-service, I'm thinking about a payment system that's very siloed, so each provider gets paid separately, uh, and again, for, for physician services, that's literally a, a payment for each type of service. For hospital services, it would be per discharge, but when the patient goes to rehabilitation, that's a separate payment. And when the patient gets readmitted, that's a separate payment. So this very, very fragmented payment model uh, that uh, essentially the, uh, the payment model supports growth in terms of volume, which again is not to say that hospitals or doctors are motivated to readmit patients unnecessarily, but if it requires an investment to prevent that from happening, the payment system will essentially make that a money losing proposition. So we can't expect much uh, work on that, uh, on that end. Uh, and so in, the, in this total cost accountability global payment kind of model that some believe we are moving towards in the delivery system, uh, then the incentives would be to really think about the whole. And so if, for example, it makes more sense to keep patients in the hospital longer and not send them to rehabilitation right away, then a global payment system will allow those trade-offs to be made without financial penalty. As they are today, hospitals have an incentive to discharge quickly, uh, and regardless of uh, the potential for readmission. Uh, in, uh, in the current payment system, again, there is this focus on when patients are uh, in a particular state of healthcare need, focused on acute care in particular, 
um, high technology interventions are more generously reimbursed, typically, uh, particularly compared to uh, non-visit based care, the use of care managers or others to help coordinate care uh, when the patient is not in, in front of the provider. And um, in this sort of nirvana total cost accountability model that the advisory board is talking about here, which may or may not resemble uh, what the current state of uh, the Medicare ACO policy is, that's the uh, uh, accountable care organization policy, that the total cost accountability is also linked to outcomes and to a broad set of quality measures, whereas in the current payment system, we typically have a very limited role for uh, relatively narrowly defined process measures of quality. When I say process measures of quality, I mean things like, um, did the patient get the right medication for asthma control? Did the patient get appropriate cancer screening tests? Uh, and so in this sort of nirvana uh, payment model, we have a, a much more holistic view uh, of the value of patient care, the total cost, as well as um, as close as we can get to outcomes. There are many technical challenges with actually making that work in a payment system, starting with do we have the right measures of quality? Do we have the, the ability to appropriately adjust for patient differences that drive things, particularly like outcomes? Uh, and so we can have some parts of that conversation there. But the point I'd like to make here is just to, to talk about what this looks like on the ground as we're in this transition where uh, there is an increasing penetration of global payment models, more quality incentives going to providers, uh, but we don't have complete transformation. And so what does that mean for physicians and hospitals? So as Paul mentioned, uh, many of the seeds of the current federal strategy for delivery system reform through payment reform were planted in the Affordable Care Act, although many of them started decades before, and I'll talk a little bit about hospital payment in particular in that context. Uh, but there are two, essentially two buckets of payment and delivery system reforms in the Affordable Care Act. One is a set of reforms that effectively changed the way Medicare paid uh, permanently uh, in, um, in the law. Uh, and one of those is the Accountable Care Organization Shared Saving Program. This program became available to providers who wanted to opt into it, opt into it in January of 2012. Uh, and so systems that meet certain requirements in terms of their ability to deliver primary care, uh, governance structure, other capabilities that would position organizations to be able to manage a population effectively, were invited to essentially take a wraparound incentive program that in addition to how they were getting paid directly through fee-for-service and DRGs for hospitals, uh, they could take accountability for the total cost of care and a set of quality measures. People debate about whether that we should call this global payment because the payment uh, through fee-for-service and DRGs doesn't go away and these, uh, these models essentially wrap around them, but they're, they are an effective transition towards a true prospective payment where the system would be paid a fixed dollar budget to manage a population potentially with additional quality incentives. So uh, I'll say more about those accountable care organizations. Uh, we have nearly 700 of them in the country now. I know you have some here in Portland. And, uh, and so that was a, a very high profile piece of the payment and delivery system reform in the Affordable Care Act, although it's uh, been a slow to adopt kind of change, but is increasingly affecting patients around the country. In addition, a number of hospital payment changes were implemented in the Affordable Care Act, including a readmission penalty and some other quality incentives that I'll say more about. And finally, very slow to come to the party when it comes to Medicare payment reform is the physician side of the ledger. The physician value-based payment modifier went into effect in January of this year, and it is slowly now going to be transitioned into a new payment incentive model. These uh, physician payment changes are much more technically challenging than the hospital or system level changes because of quality measurement, cost measurement, 
at the physician level, as well as uh, simply the mechanics of adjusting physician payment. And I'll say a little bit about wh where that's going, and I'm eager to hear your thoughts on that as well. And then on the right-hand side here, we have a set of pilots or initiatives that are effectively experiments, uh, some of them under the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation as well as other uh, more traditional demonstration programs that Medicare has done for decades. These include a bundle payment program, uh, as well as some uh, more innovative models of accountable care organizations, the pioneer ACOs uh, you may have heard about, as well as some demonstrations that involve Medicaid, which is one very important change, actually, from the Affordable Care Act, is that the federal government is doing more to help Medicaid innovate. Some states like Oregon and Massachusetts, Minnesota, others have had the capacity to innovate, but Medicaid in general, as you know, is quite underfunded, and the capacity in most states to do anything beyond paying claims is quite limited. This, um, this pediatric ACO demonstration is one of a number of important experiments, including others that involve the so-called dual eligibles, uh, the folks who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. And so these, uh, we hope, will influence policy in the future. So let me talk a little bit about the hospital side of uh, incentive and delivery system reform. Uh, on the hospital side, uh, hospitals have been the target of so-called value-based purchasing for much longer than physicians and health systems. And, uh, and this really began uh, around uh, the beginning of, uh, oh, the beginning of the millennium. It sounds profound when I say that, doesn't it? <laughs> um, when, uh, when Medicare began collecting quality information from hospitals, initially though that data collection was private. It was shared with hospitals. There uh, was a great deal of effort invested in coming up with a set of quality measures that were agreed upon by uh, st stakeholders from the hospital industry, uh, physicians, as well as Medicare and the Joint Commission. And these quality measures for hospitals began to be publicly reported in 2004. And we have moved sort of gradually and deliberately towards value-based payment systems for hospitals, again, beginning with private measurement, public measurement. If you talk to experts in quality measurement incentives, they believe that this kind of transition where hospitals have an opportunity to learn about what it takes to collect reliable data, what it takes to improve quality, is the right way to move. I, I should tell you on the physician side, all of this is happening at once with um, much less of a transition and much, uh, much to be learned in terms of quality measurement for the individual physician side. Uh, so this is really um, by way of contrast to that. Uh, on the hospital side now, there are, uh, there are essentially four big value-based purchasing programs that involve differential payment based on the quality of care. The first was introduced seven or eight years ago, and it involved essentially tweaking the hospital payment severity adjustment system. The way hospitals are paid under Medicaid, sorry, Medicare, is a fixed payment per discharge that is a function largely of diagnosis, but also of major procedures. These DRG payments are adjusted for complications and comorbidities. And some of these complications that were used to increase payments to hospitals were, in fact, complications that occurred in the, during the admission. And, uh, and so there was a great deal of uh, concern about the perverse incentives, or again, I think one could say the lack of incentives to address certain preventable complications in the hospital setting. And so certain complications that were not present on admission were identified to be excluded from this severity, severity adjustment system in 2008. And um, so we call this non-payment. It's not a penalty, it's a non-adjustment. Uh, a relatively uh, small change in Medicare payment with very modest financial consequences for hospitals, although it did get a great deal of attention when this change in Medicare payment was made. Uh, the literature to date, which is far from definitive or complete, suggests that there has been no change in the prevalence of these kinds of complications in the hospital setting. But it did uh, increase the amount of conversation that was going on in the hospital about things like hospital-acquired infections, 
other kinds of preventable, potentially preventable complications. There, there's no such thing as a complication that's 100% preventable. And so there's a bit of a trade-off here at, that you can imagine is viewed very differently from the payer side and the provider side about whether a particular complication should be a factor in, in reimbursement. The central element of hospital payment reform has been the hospital value-based purchasing program that was built on a, a model that was a demonstration about a decade ago, uh, an experiment under Medicare. And so this new hospital payment incentive program, which came into being through the Affordable Care Act, now includes rewards based on performance on measures of quality, uh, the hospital consumer assessment, I think in this case of healthcare providers survey, I'm looking at Paul who, who was uh, at the beginning of all of this. There's, it's the same acronym, but it means different things in different contexts. I, <laughs> so um, this, is, uh, this is a big uh, patient experience survey for hospitals uh, and uh, has consumed a lot of hospital energy over the last several years, both uh, collecting these data. Hospitals must collect patient experience data using an approved uh, set instrument and vendor uh, in order to measure patient experience of care on a number of fronts, including, uh, including what goes on in the hospital, but also communication around discharge, et cetera. Uh, and uh, in, so in addition to these clinical measures of quality and outcome measures, uh, as well as patient experience, now hospitals are being assessed based on the total cost of care for patients who are cared for in the hospitals. So there's a very complicated and broad formula for hospital performance. And in 2013, the bonus associated with value-based purchasing was a 1% bonus or penalty. This is uh, like many payment reforms in Medicare, it's budget neutral, so they're, the winners and losers have to balance each other out. Uh, and uh, the amount at risk goes up, escalates over time. It's always good to remember uh, that in the hospital context, 1%, if this were on total revenues, of course it's, it's on your Medicare revenues, but 1% uh, it would be a fantastic year if you made a 1% uh, profit on your, on your operating budget. Uh, so a 1% bonus or penalty is actually quite a large incentive in the hospital setting, very different on the physician side of things. In addition to the hospital-based uh, value-based purchasing program, there are these two penalty programs now uh, for uh, so-called poor outcomes. Uh, and we may agree that in some cases these are poor outcomes. What the debate is about these penalties is whether we're measuring these outcomes in a way that accurately attributes responsibility for the poor outcome to the hospital as opposed to all the other factors that may cause a readmission uh, or a hospital-acquired condition, which is another word for a hospital-acquired complication. Uh, the hospital readmission reduction program has been particularly controversial uh, in terms of the lack of risk adjustment, as particularly for uh, socioeconomic factors. The rates of readmissions are much higher in safety net hospitals and much higher for uh, low socioeconomic status population. Penalties are now up to 3% of Medicare payments for, uh, for the eligible readmissions the categories of patients uh, that Medicare is targeting. And, uh, and the program essentially uh, predicts a hospital's readmission rate based on a few factors, but not a comprehensive list of factors, and, uh, and stratifies hospitals uh, based on their readmissions rates, and th those penalties are proportional. There's also the Hospital Acquired Condition Reduction Program. Uh, the penalties for the, the Hospital Acquired Condition Reduction Program, I think that's supposed to say penalties up to 1% beginning 2013, um, that the bottom quartile of hospitals uh, based on an index of patient safety indicators uh, receive a penalty. And these, again, these will grow over time. The index of patient safety indicators, they uh, largely use measures that have been around for some time, developed originally through the Agency for Research and Quality that we were um, deriding earlier or not, or talking about the derision of earlier. Uh, and, uh, and again, there's controversy about uh, how, much, how much these measures really capture the hospital's efforts to improve patient safety 
versus other factors. Many of the individual patient safety indicators relate to extremely rare events. Uh, and so there is a great deal of instability in performance. Uh, some, uh, some analysts have looked across hospitals in terms of how well they perform on these patient safety indicators, and they can be in the top quartile one year and the bottom quartile another year. So there's a lot of variability that is not necessarily accounted for in the way the payment system works. But so you can see on the hospital side, Medicare reform is already quite comprehensive. And, uh, and the theme that you might begin to get as we move along here is that we have changes in the existing hospital payment system, changes in the existing physician payment system, and then a move to try to get away from those more fragmented payment systems altogether to move systems towards alternative payment models uh, that I'll talk about a little bit later that cut across the silos. Uh, but all of this is happening simultaneously. Uh, so if you're exhausted, I understand. Uh, uh, so again, th this is deeply personal, I know, uh, and I, I'm an economist, so I, you have my, my sympathy if anyone changed my payment along these lines in this way over this period of time, I, I'd be extremely agitated. Uh, so uh, what's happening on the physician side, uh, someone mentioned earlier the sustainable growth rate. Uh, the sustainable growth rate was uh, an idea that Congress adopted uh, a number of years ago to try to manage physician costs uh, uh, in the Medicare budget. And it, you know, it has a certain simple appeal, but not great economic logic to it. The sustainable growth rate essentially said, if in total what Medicare spends on physician payment in a given year exceeds what is believed to be a sustainable level rate of growth, then Congress will cut everyone's fees. Um, in order to maintain that sustainable growth rate. And those cuts actually happened uh, for a couple of years, but the, sort of the failure of the economic logic is it's, if you have a group of 10 doctors and you put a cap on their total payments, it's already gonna be a situation where it's like, I'm doing my best not to deliver those unnecessary MRIs, but Paul, I know he's just doing this stuff all the time, and we're in this group of 10, so there is a, what is known in other contexts as the tragedy of the commons, now you get every doctor in the United States under the same cap. Uh, there's no real incentive for any individual physician to think about the total. And so the, me the mechanics of the sustainable growth rate were not good. Uh, and then eventually the implied cuts became politically untenable. And so Congress just ignored this year after year until things got fairly ugly, and Congress was due to give doctors a pay cut at, on the order of about 30%, and uh, that was not going to happen. So a compromise was finally reached this year that would essentially transition physician payment to a new model of cost control that was focused on the individual physician. Uh, and, and that looks like a miniature version of hospital value-based purchasing. Uh, the regulations, the final regulations of the new rule, which essentially will replace that value-based physician modifier that since it's going away, I won't talk to you about. Um, the, the regulations are not out yet, so we don't know exactly how it's going to work. Uh, but uh, what we do know is this merit-based incentive program for physicians will include quality and cost in, uh, in some aggregate way uh, to score physicians in much the same way that hospitals are scored. Physicians, because we have many specialties, many settings, they will be able to choose quality measures from a menu of approved measures. How that will work is a little unclear. And, and there are really important questions also about things like attribution. So there are, for a patient who has multiple comorbidities, most Medicare patients, right, have multiple comorbidities. The endocrinologist, the cardiologist, the, the primary care physician. Who's responsible for, uh, for the total cost of care for that patient? There was, you know, a, a, a sequence of heart failure admissions. Uh, there were a number of uh, other costs. How, how should we account for this shared responsibility? And also, uh, when it comes to the total cost problem, how are we going to appropriately capture that some patients inherently use more resources than others appropriately? Uh, and to do this, if we're talking about an individual physician, 
it's basically statistically impossible uh, to measure the cost of care for an individual physician's patients. In the previous version of this, Medicare started with groups of 100 physicians or more. Uh, and so likely in this regulation also there will be some encouragement that physicians form groups for the purpose of measurement and reward. And that will be yet another incentive for the integration uh, and, uh, and in some senses sort of consolidation of the industry uh, because it simply makes more sense for this. And, and that will of course come with unintended consequences that, that may have adverse effects. Physicians will also be able to get an exemption from this merit-based incentive program by being part of um, an accountable care organization or being part of a bundle payment model. So if you're a cardiothoracic surgeon, maybe in your hospital, you're taking bundle payment for, uh, for your surgery, uh, and that would exempt you from this payment system. So there may be ways in which the merit-based incentive program will actually encourage more adoption of these optional alternative payment models. Uh, and so this is just to give you a sense, uh, yeah, without going into too much detail, again, this is a budget neutral payment incentive program. So uh, the uh, penalties are set in law and the bonuses depend on how many people get the penalties in effect. Uh, I've drawn this to suggest that they're sort of balanced, but in fact the bonuses could be bigger or smaller than the penalties depending on the distribution of performance. Uh, in the out years, this program will have the possibility of having pretty substantial uh, effects on physician payments. So a penalty of uh, up to 9% in the out years and potentially bonuses upward of that too. So that's a you know, plus or minus 9% range around your fee for service is fairly substantial. And I, I do wanna leave a few minutes for conversation and questions. Cheyenne, I'm not sure what you're, oh, thank you. Excellent, perfect, uh, since we didn't start exactly on time. Uh, so again, these are, these are incremental, but pretty sizable and meaningful in terms of what they require of hospitals and physicians. Uh, these incremental changes to existing Medicare payment are part of the momentum here, uh, but then at the same time there are these separate alternative payment models which are intended to be more transformational, really move away from the siloed payment models much more substantially, although again, these are all opt-in programs, uh, with one exception that I'll mention. The bundle payment uh, program in Medicare is a way of putting together a, a few of the provider silos, the physicians, hospitals, and in some cases, post-acute care providers, uh, so that there's a single payment across that set of providers. And uh, so a bundle payment is, uh, it's episode based, so there must be some beginning and end in a bundle payment model. In the US we have done these largely around procedure based uh, acute episodes that begin, for example, with a knee replacement or surgery or potentially a heart attack uh, in some other cases. A and the bundle is not only a way of encouraging these different silos of providers to coordinate care and to work towards a single goal, but also a way of, of looking at care over a longer span of time. So time is also a dimension here. Bundled payments, for example, frequently extend 30, 60, or 90 days over after whatever the index event is. Medicare just uh, uh, announced that they are introducing bundle payments in certain areas, uh, that is geographic areas around the country for hips and knees. Uh, and so they'll look like this where there's this single payment for a facility and its physicians and uh, post-acute care. The idea here again is to allow for optimization across a set of services where the, the margins and the substitutability um, it has some amount of discretion to it. And, uh, and also we might think that if the hospital and the post-acute care facility, for example, are being um, paid under a single payment, they will have an incentive to develop protocols whereby the uh, information gets transferred more efficiently to the, from the hospital to the post-acute care facility and patients are prevented from being readmitted by better communication 
better uh, work in the post-acute care facility. I j just saw a presentation last week from Vince Moore, who's uh, really our national treasurer when it comes to long-term care and thinking about policy there. And, and he shows how important it is uh, that there be coordination between the hospital and the post-acute care facility in terms of preventing readmissions for those patients who are quite frail and in long-term care. Uh, so so these, uh, these kinds of changes are very focused, and um, in some ways they're a manageable way to think about uh, moving towards a global payment model. They also don't generalize well. If we can't imagine really doing bundle payment for hips, for knees, and then body part by body part, getting to a system where we have more complete uh, coordination and integration, at least I can't. They, they may serve us well in some areas, but these are not really the total solution to payment reform, in my view. And what we're really looking to uh, for that is to have this broader accountability for populations of patients. Uh, at least that is the general idea around accountable care organizations. Uh, so these may be integrated entities where the hospital owns the uh, physician practice or has an exclusive relationship with a, a professional corporation. Uh, or these may be actually quite loosely organized entities uh, where, for example, a medical group has a number of contracts with different hospitals uh, for different kinds of patients uh, and uh, institutes both incentives but also mechanisms for bridging and coordinating care. I under Medicare, the initial payment model is uh, essentially a risk corridor where there's a targeted total cost of care and above and below that target there is risk sharing where both Medicare and the accountable care organization get some money back if there are savings and if there's excess spending there's a sharing of that excess spending uh, although uh, two-sided risk is not required for all ACOs in the beginning that's essentially where this is going Many private insurers have used this model as well, and Medicaid, uh, I know uh, this is the case here, Medicaid in, in certain states as well. We, we still have no good data to know uh, really what, how well this will work and what kinds of, of contractual arrangements and other uh, organizational structures are going to be most effective for managing population health, although, as someone noted earlier, this is much the same work that many of you did 20 years ago under the sort of first version of delegation and capitation. Uh, and, uh, and so many questions here, and the early data out of the Medicare accountable care organizations is very mixed. Uh, those who are enthusiasts see the glass half full. Those who are pessimists or statisticians see the glass as half random. Uh, so uh, much to be learned on the accountable care organization. But you know, again, when I think about getting payment incentives out of the way, it strikes me that moving more towards global payments of some kind really does have to be part of the solution. Uh, Fee-for-service has many benefits. We should not eliminate it. But it really makes it very challenging to care for patients in a holistic way. So uh, just to leave you with uh, my thoughts from where I sit in terms of implications for providers, I, I do think it's this vertical uh, diffusion that makes this very challenging. Six of your payers do one thing, four do another. Um, how do you decide when is the right time to invest in a care management team? And does that team only care for your Medicare patients or for all patients with complex needs? And, uh, and one thing I'm really interested in understanding is what is going on inside accountable care organizations, the challenges to leading these organizations into a delivery model that is quite fundamentally different from the current f delivery model is extreme, both in terms of the need to uh, train people to work more effectively in teams, to work with data, uh, to uh, work in ways that really are about managing total cost of care rather than generating RVUs, uh, very, very challenging. And from what I've seen so far, most of what ACOs who, that have been the early adopters have undertaken has been a set of structural changes rather than trying to change the culture uh, of the organization, rather than really trying to align incentives across the frontline providers. And so that, I think, is important future work on the provider side. Uh, but of course, there is no guarantee that all of 
this won't unravel. Uh, not all the value-based purchasing pieces of it, but global payment itself, we, we've seen it come and go before, and so I think uh, there is this very much one foot in two canoes problem for providers. Uh, and so on the policymaker side, I think uh, the challenge is that we have an opt-in system for the more sophisticated, holistic, alternative payment models, and the, the folks who have stepped forward to accept these contracts to date have already been doing these kinds of things for many years. Um, how we get to the middle and, uh, and the skeptics or laggards, depending on how you look at them, uh, pragmatists, uh, how we get there, I, I think it is going to be much more challenging. And it seems to me from the policymaker side, the big challenge is going to be to make the status quo no longer viable, which may be um, a cynical way of looking at what the merit-based incentive program is really doing on the physician side. If you want to avoid that, you need to join an ACO. So I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Comments, questions? Coffee break? <laughs> questions first. The, uh, the, I'm sorry, the hospital or the physician program? Sure. Um, uh, so caveat, I'm an economist and not a measurement specialist, but I do try to follow. Uh, so the, on the hospital side, you know, as I said, this developed in a way that uh, involved a lot of stakeholder input and development of quality measures. I, we can certainly debate um, how good they are, but for years the Joint Commission uh, CMS and uh, hospitals and physicians worked on developing those quality measures for hospitals. It, it, because the measures require chart abstraction on the hospital side, they're extremely intensive to collect. They're effectively mandatory for hospitals that want to participate in Medicare, they, with some exclusions. They essentially have to do that in order to be part of the Medicare program. Uh, and uh, so the reliability and validity, I imagine, is varied. I, uh, but there's been a lot of effort to develop and test those measures over time, uh, essentially over a 10 to 20 year period. One of the problems, though, with that measured development system is that it moves very slowly. So we're still measuring beta blockers after a heart attack. And you know, most hospitals are at 99%. It's very hard to get the process to update itself and continue to grow, so challenging. On the physician side, um, it's sort of the wild, wild west. We, you know, we have existing measure initiatives in cardiology, uh, on the primary care side, um, in other certain specialties have been d developing measures, testing them over the years, and so we have a a set of measures that may be available to Medicare. And Medicare is also the policy, at least in the, the original version of the physician payment system, has been to say, you know, if your specialty society has a registry and you want to use those measures and those data, we're going to make that possible. But there are just many specialties out there where we don't have good measures, where there has not been prior work to develop the necessary evidence. And so I think that's where I have big questions. In terms of how the measures will get um, submitted for physicians, some of them may be measurable on claims data. Certainly the cost measures, Medicare will measure on their own claims data, but many of the measures will need to come through registries, EMRs, uh, and other forms of self-report. The idea is that meaningful use and the, the physician quality reporting system that you know very few physicians ever reported through they're all coming together now in this single mode. So what you submit for meaningful use should be usable for the physician payment system as well. That's CMS's intent. The final regulations aren't there yet, but the, your questions are very well taken. I think on the physician side, there's a lot of question and concern. There'll be some specialties that 
are well situated to report reliable measures using databases that they already have, and there'll be some specialties where we're kind of making it up as we go. Yeah, so I mean, certainly the single payer would solve this problem. Uh, and when I talk to colleagues in Canada and the UK and others, <clears throat> I'm frequently jealous of, uh, of their ability to do things in, <laughs> for the whole system. Uh, and so, you know, this would look very different if there were a single payer or even an all payer system. So we have Maryland as an example of an all-payer system where these kinds of reforms are likely to come to Maryland in a very different way than the rest of the country. They have an all-payer hospital system that is getting expanded to look more like an all-payer global payment system. Uh, it, it's, it's not a solution to everything, but it does, it does really make that alignment problem go away. It, although, you know, I have to say in England um, in particular, in the NHS, they have, uh, they have the ability to turn things on a dime, and they do it every three years, uh, which makes the system uh, sort of exhausted, and um, th you know, that much change all at once can be challenging too. But, but you're right, uh, that, that will remain a challenge. Uh, Medicare can drive a lot of delivery system change. If you think about DRGs, and, and maybe this is, you know, this is not DRGs, unfortunately, but DRG adoption happened very quickly, Medicare really drove that. Commercial payers, many state Medicaid agencies followed in a way that it effectively made hospital payment more or less aligned, although some of that unraveled over time. And hospitals still now, they kind of have their DRG-based business, and depending on where you are in the country, and then you make all your money on your cost-based reimbursement for those payers that can't negotiate <laughs> DRGs. So it will never be perfect to drive it through Medicare. M Medicaid is a whole other question. It's very hard to drive anything through Medicaid except cost shifting. Uh, and so that is a real challenge where alignment between Medicare and Medicaid and uh, where states are willing and have the political ability to align some of what goes on in the, with the private payers and Medicaid will be much more effective. Nope, nope. Oh. I'd be happy to talk about that on the panel. It's a, it's a great question, and, and it partial, partially it's like another ACO model, but it's a little different, right? So um, it's really interesting to think about Medicare Advantage's role in all of this. <laughs> yeah, perfect, or, or the coffee break.